Hey class, how are you doing? Hopefully you watched that SOHO forum debate um, with uh, Nina Teicholtz and Dr. David Katz. Uh, if you haven't yet, uh, a lot of this really won't be uh, in any sort of context or make much sense. I understand that the debate is about an hour and a half, but really to get the uh, basic parts of what I'm trying to get through in this lecture, all you really have to do or watch the first hour or so. Um, there, there's a few, um, uh, not real timestamps, but pseudo timestamps that I placed throughout this lecture that kind of point to uh, almost as far as I want you to go. And um, the reason that I find this lecture to be important is for all of us to see how decision making, uh, uh, well, really research, this is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, with how people make decisions because both these individuals are very intelligent and they both have access to the same uh, literature research and they come away with entirely different conclusions. And if, uh, if I'm being honest about my biases, um, uh, I, I, I do lean a little bit more towards uh, the Nina Teicholtz uh, aspect of it. Um, but I, I, I'll try to keep all of that to myself as much as I can. Really what all of this is about is paying attention to logical fallacies that, uh, both of them do. And there's going to be a running count, um, uh, somewhere in the top right hand corner of this, uh, uh throughout the lecture. So hopefully you follow along with that. So, uh, First off, just kind of explaining uh, right here, this is Nina Teicholtz, uh, Big Fat Surprise. Uh, really, um, if you've never read any of her books, as I'm sure many of you haven't heard of her, uh, she's actually a, a, a really good writer and fairly fascinating to read. And um, Dr. David Katz right here, he's a very well accomplished um, uh, researcher and doctor. So I, uh, I, I think finding his work is uh, uh, great as well. So bo both of these individuals are very uh, good to pay attention to, but, uh, oh gosh, yeah, I always do stuff like that, huh? Um, the first thing I wanted to ask is who won, because this is an Oxford-style debate, so individuals in the audience uh, essentially voted on uh, what their opinion was before and after, um, and if you got all the way to the end, like, it'll show you who actually ended up winning, which I'm going to uh, not tell you because I actually want you to watch all of it and that might end up being a test question uh, at some point. But uh, I don't know, just like pay attention to this um, stuff. Well, first off, I'm just being funny a little bit. Um, this this Nana joke, if anybody's ever heard this German band, they have a uh, interesting song about the beginning of the uh, Third World War with like a red balloon, but I like, that doesn't matter. And um uh, so Nina, Nana, uh, that's, this is my nonsense humor. And here's, here's just a picture of David Katz. He's uh, a very good looking man and he's in super good shape. And also he's a pretty hardcore vegan. So if the proof isn't somewhat in the pudding of, you know, how he looks, it's, I, I don't know, it's uh, uh, fairly effective in a way. So here, let's look at a couple of these things. So uh, starting off, um, the, the debate. This is their resolution, which effectively they're arguing for or against. And Nina uh, Teicholtz, uh, affirmative, meaning she's arguing for it. Uh, uh, David Katz, negative, arguing against it. And um, later on, we'll get into this, but uh, Dr. David Katz, he really dices this up pretty well in a way that makes it seem like he's almost unbeatable, even though he's talking about how he's... Um, uh, how, how this is a sand trap. It really isn't how, how he's explaining it, but there is little or no rigorous evidence that vegan or vegetarian diets are healthier than diets that include meat, eggs, and cheese or dairy. I, um, I, I might've actually copied this wrong, but cheese, dairy, uh, you know, uh, similar things. So that's really what they're talking about. So things that they bring up, what is little or no? What does that actually mean? What does the word rigorous even mean? Um, and we have a hierarchy of research within our class and all that type of stuff. And um, 
vegan or vegetarian diets. Uh, David Katz points out a lot of interesting things with this. I'll, I'll have a picture come up here soon um, whenever I get to his stuff. And uh, also here, that's a curious and, which I, I don't know why um, David Katz didn't go into this more, but uh, dairy, most of the planet is actually lactose intolerant. So if they're consuming dairy, then it's actually not so great for them. If, if anybody in the class is lactose intolerant and you've drank a whole glass of milk, you could speak to very well how painful <laughs> that it is. Um, myself, I'm very lactose tolerant, so I'm happy about that, but um, uh, especially living in Wisconsin now, so that's kind of cool. Uh, there's three aspects to rhetoric and argument that I want you to know and try to pay attention to. So this first one right here, ethos or credibility. Uh, I, I mean, it ties in closely with the word ethics, which, you know, is kind of the study of, you know, doing right and wrong and all of that, if anybody's ever taken a philosophy class. But um, in terms of rhetoric and argument, ethos actually more means credibility. Like, who are you to be saying anything? So um, uh, really, um, that whole question of ethos and credibility, whenever I was younger and going through graduate school, I was told that if I did not have a PhD, nobody would listen to me. So uh, effectively, a large reason why I ended up uh, trying to get a PhD, or I, I mean, not trying, I did, uh, was in order to bolster up or boost my credibility. And being on the other side of it, I can assure you that uh, just because you have a PhD, I, it's almost like even less people listen to me now, but that's, uh, um, well, that's a joke. And clearly it's not funny because you don't hear laughter. That's all right. Um, pathos or appeal to emotion. And um, uh, Nina Teicholz is um, really the main one who does any of that. Uh, logos or logic. And Really, what that means is, uh, are, are, are arguments, are they logically coherent? Are they uh, cogent? Are they sound, unsound? All sorts of things like that. We could get into um, symbolic logic, and logic is a whole area of study within the realm of philosophy, and it's super interesting. Whenever I was in school, I loved those classes, but I'm not going to get into them um, with you. Uh, uh, now because, well, I mean, it, it could be an entire semester. Uh, but here, starting off, this is almost the first um, uh, debate here, that it, it almost implies a false dichotomy, so that there's not really any gray between um, uh, between this. So uh, how, how much meat is bad? How many eggs are bad? You know, it, it, it's drastically different from eating um, two eggs every morning to 50 eggs every day. You know, I mean, I, I, I think that's somewhat intuitive, but starting off, this almost begins on a very strange premise, right? Uh, that, you know, uh, are healthier. Well, I, I, I don't know. I'm not even sure I believe in the word healthier. Uh, so Nina, uh, Ty Schultz, um, her, um, uh, very interesting person. Here's just a little bit of background on her. So she wrote a book in 2014, uh, she also earned a degree in American Studies um, at Stanford University and completed her master's in Latin American Studies at Oxford University. So uh, she she is well educated. She's um, a, a woman of a woman of letters, so to speak. Uh, but none of that really. Uh, speaks about really hardcore like nutrition and all of that. So that uh, right there, um, I don't know, your spidey sense somewhat should be going off a little bit about how, well, should we be listening to her if you didn't uh, spend many years in like a nutritional biochemistry lab or whatever. But also maybe that's not an important thing in terms of making sense of all of this. Um, uh, but here, here, let's just move on a little bit. She was a reporter for NPR, uh, which I'd... Um, I, I know that that might lose some of our more uh, conservative students and uh, gain some of our more liberal students. And I mean, that's cool. Like NPR is great um, or bad. Who cares? Um, uh, New York Times and also Men's Health. Uh, so she, she's been doing many things for all of those. She was assigned to do a, uh, a story on trans fats, 
which if anybody doesn't know anything about trans fats, um, there's uh, like four different types of fats. So we have saturated fats, which are normally in animal products, uh, butter, uh, beef, cheese, all sorts of things. Um, solid at room temperature. There's polyunsaturated fats and monounsaturated fats, which are more found in uh, plant products. Uh, so monounsaturated fat, typically you think olive oil, something like that, avocados, whatever. And then trans fats, which are essentially polyunsaturated fats that go through something called a hydrogenation process, where essentially they just beat it to death with a bunch of hydrogens until it's not a curved fat and it's more straight and it looks like a saturated fat. So um, a trans fat is essentially a polyunsaturated fat, which most people think is healthy. Um, now, I, some people actually disagree on that uh, for uh, various reasons, and I, I'm not going to get into it. But trans fats are made to look like saturated fats, so effectively margarine, or I can't believe it's not butter. Things that are butter substitutes are trans fats mostly. And uh, uh, they're almost universally agreed that they are bad for you. And uh, people on almost every side of nutrition, like hardcore Atkins, paleo people, hardcore vegan vegetarians, all of them would pretty much agree that trans fats are bad for you. But she was writing this, uh, uh, that story, and then she came across all of this um, uh, stuff about how saturated fat is kind of unfairly maligned. And I mean, there's various reasons to uh, actually believe what she's saying. Um, now, within all of this, when, when whenever she's talking, oh, well, here, I'm going to go back uh, just a little bit. She said something that uh, th this is probably a fallacy, and I didn't count it. Um, but she said that she read thousands and thousands of studies for making this book. Now... Uh, she very well could have. A lot of people have read thousands and thousands of studies. I don't know if I would claim that I've read thousands and thousands of studies because essentially you would have to read a study a day for, you know, three years or so um, with a couple of breaks to get a thousand studies. And for those of you in class uh, that have read um, a study all the way through, it takes a long time to really get through it, and not just to get through it, but to understand it. So if you're reading thousands and thousands of studies, you know, I would tend to believe that you're probably just glancing at them, reading the abstract. Now, many researchers, including myself in a lot of cases, do this. Um, we'll read the abstract to see if things make sense. If we don't know much about a topic, we will actually read the introduction. But uh, say, for example, if I'm reading about something I'm an expert in, I actually don't read the introduction because I don't need an introduction into the topic. I really just uh, go to the methods and the results. And um, a lot of the time, individuals will just read the discussion and an abstract, and they will only go back and look through the methods and results if something was reported that didn't make sense to them. And that's, that's fairly common. So it, in lectures in the past, we've talked about confirmation bias. So uh, those of you know me about low-carbohydrate research, I would look into quite a bit uh, low-carbohydrate research that reported that something bad or negative happened. Because, I mean, most of my research showed something either uh, nothing happened or something good. Um, but that's that, that's just one thing I wanted to point out about her, uh, some hyperbole or over-exaggeration. Like, I mean, most people haven't read thousands and thousands of studies, and especially every single word of them. Uh, now, her first fallacy, um, this is uh, kind of pointing out uh, something relatively interesting. So her and David Katz, uh, I, I think it's a pretty interesting debate because these two actually do not like each other, or at least that's what I surmise from listening to them. And uh, this this debate was their, uh, and, and uh, they say this, this is their first actual meeting. So um, before uh, David Katz 
wrote some, uh, you know, fairly unnice things about her. And uh, here, like, I just took a screenshot of all of these different things, and this is called an ad hominem fallacy. So uh, it, it means, um, uh, like, an argument against the person or an attack of the person. So uh, it, it is marginalizing people in somewhat of, of a way. So uh, I, I don't know, like, saying, oh, I can't listen to this person because... I don't know, whatever insult, you know, I, I, I don't want to say any, uh, that come to my mind since this is being recorded. Um, and, uh, something that she did was she actually went to attack, uh, Dr. David Katz's credibility that he works for this Yale Griffin uh, Prevention Research Center, and it actually has no association with Yale. Um, uh, so uh, Yale, I think everyone knows this is an Ivy League school. It, it carries a lot of weight to it. Um, so here she's questioning his credibility that uh, this Yale uh, Prevention Research Center only has the name, but it actually doesn't have any like legit association with Yale, even though I went into this a little bit and it does. So this is an important thing that like anytime someone says something, I oh, mean, you always have to look it up. Um, but here's just one of the cases. So here she's attacking his credibility. So, uh, here, pay attention up here. I, I'm trying to do my best, uh, counting like Nina and David's, um, uh, fallacies thus far. Uh, so here is her appeal to emotion. Like how can you, uh, or how can she be on a debate stage with someone that has been so uncivil to her? Um, and you know, she gets some applause for this and everything like that, which I, I, I understand her point, but um, this really does nothing to, uh, or at least it really shouldn't do anybody's, um, do anything to make you sway your opinion on like, well, is a vegan vegetarian diet good or is eating meat good or whatever? Like this is um, really, she's trying to get people sympathy, which is a very effective rhetorical technique to win a debate, but it's, um, I, I don't find it to be a great way in order to actually be right. It's, it's a good way to win, not always be right. I, I guess that's how I would like to, uh, put that. Um, now here she reframes the debate a little bit with, um, uh, like this whole thing of there's little or no rigorous evidence, uh, all, all of that already read that to you. Um, so from here, a hypothesis that plant-based foods are superior, so she's reframing it that way. So um, both of them are essentially like rephrasing things, and um, that, that's one of the best ways to win a debate is if you reframe various premises uh, uh, to make it in your favor, right? So for a hypothesis to be uh, seen as true, it must be supported by rigorous evidence with replication. So uh, there she's um, talking about rigorous evidence, and this is effectively what she is meaning. On our hierarchy of scientific evidence, if it's not an RCT or up, then to her it does not count as rigorous evidence. Um, uh, what else? Uh, in addition, the hypothesis cannot be substantially contradicted by factual information. Yeah, I, I like, like I'm getting that, and uh, and with replication. So. Uh, various things there. Um, so here is somewhat of another attack uh, that uh, um, she puts forward is that uh, like the global consensus on all of this that plant-based diets are so great. This is uh, um, well li like an argument to the people. So he here uh, I'm just going to read this to you. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to make sense of this. So, is a fallacious argument that concludes that a proposition must be true because many or most people believe it. And something I always think about, if anybody knows who Henry David Thoreau is, one of my heroes, um, he said something, I, I, I'm not sure I'm going to get this right, but he said that um, uh, truth is not democratic. And uh, yeah, well, like, just because most people believe it, then it must be so. Well, no. I, the, this is almost like 
a bandwagon fallacy to where, um, well, if all of your friends jump off a bridge, would you? And if you say yes, it's like, oh, okay, your bandwagon effect, that type of thing. So getting in with everybody else. Um, so she, here she's pointing out uh, that fallacy somewhat. Um, and then she explains some interesting stuff with nutritional epidemiology, and hopefully everyone remembers our correlation lectures, and uh, epidemiology faces its limits, all of that type of stuff. So where nutritional epidemiology, uh, I, I, I believe she said that it is correct 0 to 20% of the time, something like that. And I mean, you know, like that's fairly believable, and she talks about Correlation does not uh, mean causation. I, I, I think all of us have heard this so many times, probably from me, enough. And that uh, here she brings this up, that breast cancer goes up with the number of internet users. Now, there there's not really much reason to believe that using the internet causes breast cancer, even though um, uh, there might be some other things that internet users, like... Uh, more industrialized places probably eat more sugar, and eating more sugar is probably somewhere related to cancer growth, and you know, than breast cancer. So I, I mean, there's almost always some confounding variable, uh, and she talks about false positives that you know we measure something to be true in a scientific study. Nutritional epidemiology is what she's talking about, and it's not true in reality because it's a spurious relationship or. Um, uh, I don't know, like an untrue correlate, or well, not an untrue correlation, but an untrue causation, and uh, 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 cool stuff there. And she talks about food frequency questionnaires, so really she's calling into question how rigorous a lot of the research is that supports that vegan vegetarian diets are better than diets that include, you know, meat, eggs, cheese, all of that, um, because I, and I'm sorry that this is a little bit, you know, uh, fuzzy. But, like, here's an example of bananas. Uh, I'm, I'm sure many of us eat bananas. Bananas are great. Um, uh, and, I, gosh, I, I, I actually just heard a song from, I think it was 1936, called I Like Bananas Because They Don't Have Any Bones. And uh, look that up if you, if you want to laugh, but that's not related to class. Um, but a food frequency questionnaire here with bananas, um, uh, well, how frequently do you eat bananas? And how reliable is your memory on all of that type of stuff? Um, uh, myself, for whatever reason, I, I, I basically never eat bananas. Um, but, you know, on most health markers, I'm pretty good. Uh, so, well, wh wh what does that mean? Like, I, I don't know. Like, I just don't like them whenever they go super brown all the time. Uh, but here, never or less than once per month. Well, less than once per month and never once per month. I mean, I, I mean, how many of you eat bananas once per month, two to three times per month, and would actually remember that in any possible way? And also, what in the world do we mean by medium? You know, so like small, medium, and large banana. Wow. I, I don't know. Like, is a banana... I And, and there are various factors that people use for this, like, I mean, a banana is probably somewhere between five and seven inches, uh, but does anybody actually, like, take out a tape measure and measure how long their banana is before they eat it? Um, I don't think that that's uh, fairly common. Uh, she referenced this one paper, and I've, I've talked about this paper a couple of times, and uh, uh, Johnny Unitas uh, is a, I, one of the smartest human beings to ever walk the earth, so... I, I don't know, like, you, you can read this um, uh, summary right here, and I, I think it's very interesting to pay attention to um, all sorts of researchers, even though, like, this is more than 10 years old. It's still uh, great stuff to pay attention to. Um, next thing she talks about, well, so here with that John Unitas, this is somewhat of a strange fallacy right here that science has been wrong before, and this is a mixture of what's called a continuum fallacy and a nirvana fallacy. So really the one I want to focus on the most is the uh, nirvana fallacy, which, you know, I mean, uh, hopefully everyone knows uh, about nirvana. Um, but the kind of almost pie-in-the-sky, like, utopian idea of that 
there is a perfect solution to all sorts of things. And especially within the realm of like diet and nutrition, there's uh, so much individuality in how people respond to certain things. I mean, some people are lactose tolerant, some people aren't. Um, I mean, there's different co uh, amounts of copies of the gene of salivary amylase in people's you know bodies, so that would drastically alter how people uh, deal with things. And you know, maybe uh, uh, it well, it's it's just so complex, like. Uh, a lot of times people think about drinking Cokes and Dr. Peppers and things as being bad for you, but uh, which I, I, I would have to think it's probably bad for your teeth almost all the time, um, but don't cite me on that. But if you're uh, like running a bunch of marathons and you're actually burning all of that sugar, well, I, I mean, does it really matter? You know, it's um, because if we burn off a certain thing, well, all right, it, um, I, if, if, if we don't store something in our body, it, like it might not be that big of a deal. Um, then uh, here, uh, she starts uh, citing some things. Um, so some systematic reviews and meta-analyses of randomized controlled trials. And here, uh, she's really citing the conclusion right here, um, where essentially it's mixed findings related heart disease. Uh, so kind of one common finding is higher meat diets, lower carbohydrate diets tend to increase HDL cholesterol, whereas vegetarian diets tend to lower it, but sometimes increase blood triglycerides, but they lower overall cholesterol. So it almost always seems like a give and a take right there. But here where it's saying in all mixed findings, uh, I don't know if anybody remembers that um, paper that we looked at where um, uh, men who ate more red meat got in more car accidents and uh, women who smoked more, exercised less, and ate more red meat had a lower death rate. So it's really with all of this, just citing something like this, well, for us to make sense of it, we have to go read this paper. And uh, I, now I'm not going to analyze it for you right here, but just be aware that, you know, people could uh, do various things. And this is something that she says right here, that uh, I, I want to point out as another fallacy. So you would not prescribe a pill to a patient that, you, that had not undergone a rigorous trial. Why would you do that with a diet? Now, this is uh, a false equivalence fallacy. So meaning an argument or claim in which two completely opposing arguments appear to be logically equivalent when they are not. And uh, now I... Uh, uh, David Katz does a false equivalency later on whenever he throws the apple up and it comes down, all of that type of stuff. But food and pills are not quite the same. And I, I, it feels weird even saying that. Uh, but I, I think it's... I, hopefully it's obvious to you that a drug that treats cholesterol or diabetes is inherently different than broccoli or bacon or a cheeseburger, right? Now, they might have similar effects, but um, uh, typically most pills are dealing with a particular substance that uh, is in a small enough quantity that it wouldn't kill us. But, uh, well, I mean, we can eat a lot of cheeseburgers and we're not going to deal with the effects of it until much later down the line. But if we take too much of a particular pill, then our liver is going to be quite damaged uh, in a lot of cases, right? So um, just something to pay attention to. Um, now here, this is a meta-analysis, and it's a meta-analysis of randomized control trials. So really, that, that, that's pretty good. Um, now here, she does another uh, fallacious argument, which... Um, I used to be a vegetarian, and this is um, uh, what's called the anecdotal fallacy. And one thing, like anecdote, is essentially one person's experience with something. And one person's experience with anything really doesn't tell us much other than what that's what their experience was. That's why we don't use case reports uh, to have information for the total population, right? Um, so... Uh, her, like, who, who's to say, like, what type of vegetarian that she was? Um, 
uh, and she even talks about eating tons of pasta. And, well, like, uh, I don't know if anyone has ever been a vegetarian before in the class, but, uh, but I have. I, I was vegetarian for 12 years. And, uh, I, I mean, I basically never ate pasta. So you can certainly um, be a vegetarian and never eat pasta, or you can eat it all the time. Um, but uh, I, I don't know. I think orangutans are very funny. It's not related to anything, but that's okay. Um, right here, she uh, goes into another um, argument that uh, uh, David Katz is going to bring up. And uh, now how she talks about blue zones. Now, if, if those of you don't know what blue zones are, um, uh, well, you should know what blue zones are if you listen to the debate, but I, I'll just recap it. There's various areas on the planet that are really great at producing centenarians or people that live a very long time and are very healthy. So uh, uh, one, one of the main blue zones is uh, Okinawa, uh, Japan. So it's a little island, and it's actually where um, karate started. So uh, uh, fairly interesting. And these people live uniquely long. And she talks about how the data was obtained in um, uh, 1949 and later. And they had just, uh, well, World War II had just happened and all that type of stuff. So people weren't eating very much. And there's one thing for sure that will increase, well, I mean, not for sure, but likely. But fasting and not eating enough calories, that will probably increase how long you live. But, um, but these blue zones just places where people live a little bit longer. And she says that uh, David Katz is going to use this blue zone argument to, uh, f for his side of the argument. And, uh, and he does, so this is almost a straw man fallacy, but it's, it's really not because he actually used it. So what the straw man fallacy means is, uh, well, uh, here, um, uh, given, uh, given the impression of refuting an opponent's argument while actually refuting an argument that was not represented by that opponent. So like building up a straw man and tearing them down is effectively what that is. So really just making it to where you can argue against something fairly easy. And uh, here, here she, uh, it seems like she's going to do this, but he actually uses this Blue Zone argument later on, which one thing, one of the biggest criticisms of the Blue Zones is that, well, these people walk a lot, they, uh, they garden, they have strong relationships with friends and family, they have really good communities, they relax, they de-stress, they do all sorts of things, right? So um, is it the vegan or vegetarian diet that they are uh, doing that um, uh, is really making them live so much longer? Uh, so, uh, but uh, D David Katz does talk about it in many ways. Uh, so her last three arguments are um, uh, somewhat causation correlational um, issues uh, going uh, not quite there yet. So here's one of them, U.S. consumption uh, by calories. So more calories going up, animal foods are going down, total food, uh, all of this stuff minus sugar. So obesity and diabetes are going up, and we're actually eating more fruits and vegetables and less animal foods. But really, the, I mean, this is kind of the thing um, with this total calories going up, and if we look at this, now this isn't a formalized fallacy, but I think it should make sense to us. So it's kind of a numerator denominator fallacy. So um, here, uh, red meat consumption is going down, whole milk is going down, eggs is going down a little bit, animal fats, butter, all those are going down. So think about that as the numerator. So in a fraction, the top number, right? That number um, is going down. But the denominator is going up, well, um, uh, so much that, yes, we're eating a lower percentage of red meat. But one thing I can tell you for sure, in 2014, an absolute quantity of red meat. We are eating more red meat in pounds than they were eating in 1970. So the total amount is up, just the proportion is down. The um, the thing with that is we're just eating more of everything now. Um, 
and, you know, hence total calories. So we're just eating more food quantity. Uh, so yes, yes, a smaller proportion of it is red meat, but we're eating a higher absolute amount of red meat. You know, like say back then they were eating, I don't know, one pound of red meat a week. Now we're eating two pounds of red meat per week. But back then they were eating, I don't know, like uh, five pounds of food per week. And now we're eating 10 pounds of food per week. So the proportion's down, but, you know, we're just eating more stuff. Uh, uh, next thing that she does is the, oh shoot, what is this fallacy called? Um, uh, the appeal to nature fallacy. Uh, so all of these civilizations um, uh, uh, ate all sorts of meat and all of that type of stuff. So uh, it's natural, so it must be good. But you know what else is natural? Um, uh, death, famine, starving, war. All of those things are fairly natural. I mean, like, that's always happened throughout human history. Uh, also, um, arsenic is natural. Um, cyanide is also naturally occurring. So, uh, yeah, I mean, like, uh, venom and poison from different animals, you know, cobras and things, are all natural. That doesn't mean they're good for you. So, um, yeah, yeah, I know. I I don't know, like, that, that is a fallacious argument right there, because back then, throughout most of history, people were just trying to not starve and die, and these days, well, you know, we're trying to, uh, I, I don't know, like, it's just, it, it, it's not a good argument, um, uh, which, this is the basic tenet of the paleo argument, uh, but, uh, I, like, I won't talk about that, um, too much more, so, right there, that's, all I'm really going to talk about with uh, Nina Teicholtz. Um, now for David Katz, a couple of his arguments. Let's go into that. He uh, he reminds us of the resolution of the argument, and um, he's pointing to all of these uh, words like what does little mean, what does rigorous mean, what does healthier mean. And um, uh, gosh, I the word health is such a confusing word that... I don't know, I, I have a rough time even thinking about it. And also he talks about include, what does include meat, eggs, dairy, you know, like occasionally all the time. And uh, right now, I, I think it's obvious, or I, well, I, uh, if it's not obvious, I, I hope to make it so, that he is a skilled debater. He's probably a more skilled debater than she is. Um, and uh, just from him getting, uh, like, higher degrees and things, well, you, you learn some of these argumentation uh, uh, things uh, in order to win. That, like, well, you know, like, let's break down these words. Uh, one, one big thing that he says is operational definitions. And an operational definition is, uh, like, let's take the word healthy, for example. If we operationally define health as your circulating cholesterol, which many people do in research, um, then that's what we're going to use to say healthy, not healthy. So there's um, uh, just kind of a thought behind that. So uh, operational definitions might be good. They might not always be right. Um, uh, so he says that uh, Nina has to demonstrate an absence of evidence because if he shows just uh, something or a little bit, well, you know, uh, then he wins. Um, uh and also, this is a fairly interesting falsifiability thing where just be, uh, well, absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. Um, uh, uh, interesting argument. Um, so even if he fails to show any rigorous evidence, there still could be some somewhere. And I, I don't know if anybody remembers uh, uh, falsifiability and things that make things science uh, that we talked about earlier in the semester. But... Uh, that's the thing. And uh, here he makes a good point that um, if you're consuming Coke and cotton candy, um, uh, that's a vegan diet. And if you add ice cream to it, that's a vegetarian diet. Um, now, this is somewhat a straw man. I don't think Nina Teicholz actually believes this. Uh, uh, but uh, really, none of the research, um, uh, at least not that I'm aware of, has actually investigated any of that type of... Well, actually, you know what? There has been enough research on, like, say, the Twinkie diet 
where you eat a certain amount of Twinkies every day, but you control your calories and then all of your health markers get better. So, well, I, and uh, I, I think Twinkies actually are vegetarian friendly, I think. Um, uh, now, now, don't trust me on that. Um, but, uh, but here, um, then he, well, this isn't really stacking the deck. Uh, a lot of us use this term stacking the deck incorrectly. Um, uh, this is actually what stacking the deck means, um, which any evidence that supports and oppose an argument is simply rejected, omitted, or ignored. But he's kind of bolstering his side quite a bit. Um, he's saying that uh, if someone eats venison or Greek yogurt, or um, I, I think I just put in human blood, um, uh, on occasion, uh, then that really shouldn't be counted. If, if it's a small amount of your diet. Uh, so really he wants diets that are built out of plants versus ones that routinely include meats, eggs, and dairy. Now something they didn't talk about that I really wish they would have, which has always been one of my confusing questions with this. So are, are you getting uh, most of your food volume from vegetables? Or are you getting most of your calories from vegetables? Because um, it it's hard to get enough calories out of, you know, broccoli, leafy greens, things like that, because they're so um, nutrient dense, but um, calorie sparse, or uh, I, I forget other more eloquent ways to say that. Um, but there there's a big question right there. Like if you're you could certainly get most of your calories from meat, but get an extravagant amount of food volume from salads, vegetables, all of that type of stuff. So I, I wish they would have gotten into that, but they but they really don't. And he points out that and and all that type of stuff. Um, uh, now, something uh, interesting here where the uh, moderator, um, I forget this uh, man's name, but, but uh, also a very intelligent man and well-spoken. Um, uh, so he's saying that he's arguing left-handed, like Diego Montoya or whatever, that he's arguing for something that he doesn't necessarily believe, and that he essentially just agreed to the terms and conditions of the debate. But the moderator right here said, well, no, uh, I, we gave both of you uh, time to refine it into something that you agreed to argue about. So there's... Uh, a particular problem right there. I, I kind of caught him in a bit of a lie, but um, that's neither here nor there. Um, uh, also, he does a few of these interesting uh, rhetorical things. Um, so repetition of words, uh, repetition of clauses or phrases, uh, very good uh, rhetorical ways of getting people on your side. And uh, if anybody follows anything to do with uh, politics, this is kind of what they do. Uh, like if you say something enough times, people will tend to believe it. And um, uh, really, there's not really much point for me having this slide up other than I wanted you to I wanted you to read this quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson because uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. Like some things bring me a lot of happiness, and Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau were some of those people. Uh, so. What lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny compared to what lies within us. Whew, I, I think that's deep, but, y you know, I, uh, maybe I'm lame. Likely I'm very lame. But he, he does that quite a bit. Uh, uh, now he says uh, what he thinks the resolution means, so he makes some operational definitions. Um, so vegetarian and vegan diets, sensible and complete in various ways. Uh, healthier, so he's saying less premature death, less chronic illness, and include meaning routine. That's kind of what he takes all that stuff to mean. Um, uh, so so he, he gives us a few more. So little, it's wrong uh, if he can show a bunch. No is wrong if he can show any and rigorous who decides. Um, uh, uh, various interesting stuff here. Uh, and Now he does concede uh, this nature of various things. Um, I'm not going to talk about that too much. Uh, but here's one of the things that he does that um, uh, I, I, I think is interesting. Um, so it's called an appeal to authority. So this is another logical fallacy. 
So he's been asked to write numerous reviews. He's authored uh, nutrition textbooks. Um, he's co-authored uh, uh, many things. He's done a bunch of randomized control trials, and he's even invented research methods, which he actually did. It's um, uh, you could look into it a little bit more if you wanted, if you want to. But hierarchy is a of evidence um, applied to lifestyle medicine and um, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. I'm actually a reviewer for them, and I've uh, done a fair couple of things for these lifestyle medicine people. I've actually been a co-author in a chapter in one of their textbooks. So uh, those of you that know me, uh, him and I are on similar ground for a couple of these things. Um, uh, but the, the problem here that I see is, well, right, you could have done all of these things, but what if it sucked? You know, it's, um, uh, uh, we would have to read it and weigh it, um, on, on, on its own merits, but, um, people frequently do things that are bad. Um, I, I can think of numerous musical artists that have written so many songs, but they all were terrible, you know? So, I mean, it's, uh, well, well, I'm not going to belabor those points too much. Um, uh, now, I don't believe that many of David Katz's things are actually really good, but, you know, like, they could be bad. Um, uh, now, now, this one thing that he does, Red Herring, that they've been translating to a bunch of languages, well, I mean, that doesn't really have anything to do with anything, now does it? Um, uh, now, here, uh, pause and watch this. Um, uh, so, it, it's only about, what is that, four minutes or so? Um, very, very interesting. Um, well, I, I don't know if any of you watched it. I, I, it. I'm not sure it matters that much, but this is a clear example of the dilution effect. So he's showing so many research studies, and he's really only taken away the conclusions of them, um, not giving us nearly enough time to pull these apart and be like, well, wh what are the merits of this study or that study or this study or whatever? So... Uh, that's, uh, this is a rhetorical problem, like, uh, throwing people mountains and mountains of, you know, evidence or research or whatever, like, that doesn't mean it's good, you know, it's, uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, but, but he does that one time. Uh, so here's one study, uh, that he talks about, and I'm going to go a little bit more in depth into it. Um, so this, uh, this is a fairly classic study. So, um, can lifestyle changes reverse, uh, coronary, uh, heart disease, uh, lifestyle heart trials. So Dean Ornish and most people on the vegan vegetarian side point to this, uh, showing that it actually ends up reversing, uh, atherosclerosis. And, uh, I'm sorry, I have a very difficult time saying that word, but, um, uh, yeah, like, like it, it actually does do this. So it's a prospective randomized control trial. So good stuff, high on the hierarchy of evidence, um, the average percent diameter stenosis. So that's just narrowing of uh, the coronary arteries. Um, regression, um, 40 to uh, uh, 37 some odd percent, whatever it is, like we could look at all of this. So there's an experimental group and a control group. Um, and, well, it actually looks like this, so uh, reversing so that it actually opens quite a bit. Um, uh, uh, very interesting stuff. Like, I mean, if anybody has heart disease, I like it, it would be uh, great to reverse it. Um, but if we actually go uh, into that study and read it, um, here's a couple of things about it that, um, uh, people, uh, like neglect to talk about. Now it was, um, uh, vegetarian in nature and not vegan because it did include animal things, but here, check this out. The control group, um, were not asked to make lifestyle changes, although they were free to do so. Now, if you don't ask people, uh, they tend to not do anything, um, and almost all of them had a, a progression in their coronary artery problem, meaning it got worse. Uh, now the experimental group, they were asked to eat a low-fat vegetarian diet for at least a year. So fruits, vegetables, grains, legumes, soy products, uh, various things. Um, caloric restriction. So 
Uh, calorie restriction. Okay, interesting. Uh, fruits and vegetables. Maybe they weren't eating fruits and vegetables before. They probably weren't. Um, most people don't eat very many. Um, no animal products were allowed except for egg whites and one cup per day of nonfat milk or yogurt, um, which uh, I, I think that's a strange spelling of yogurt, but I, I it, it might be a, um, a British spelling of it. So the diet contain 10% calories from fat, which were polyunsaturated, uh, fatty unsaturated, like they had ratio uh, right there, um, around 15, 20% protein, predominantly complex carbohydrate, cholesterol was limited to very low amounts, salt was restricted, caffeine was eliminated, alcohol was limited. Okay, so like they stopped drinking coffee, so no uh, soy, venti, mocha, chino, whatever things. Um, so way less sugar, all right? Salt's going down, which these people might be salt sensitive. Uh, most of the population actually isn't salt sensitive, uh, meaning eating more salt raises their blood pressure, but these individuals may have been. Uh, 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 also, they probably went down in their alcohol consumption, um, and it was nutritionally adequate. Uh, uh, and they supplemented vitamin B12. Now, this control group didn't do very much. Uh, in, in that regard, but but over here, they did stress management techniques, they exercised more, they listened to, I, I, I love this, an hour of audio cassette um, uh, to, you know, like, de-stress or self-care, whatever you want to call it, right? But they're, they're effectively changing everything about how they're living, but they're attributing it, it, they're attributing it to the diet which I, th I think all of us within our major or, you know, just in general know that managing stress is really good for you. Exercising is really good for you. Alcohol, probably not great. Um, uh, caffeine, now I, I'm a bit dubious on that. I, I, I think caffeine is probably pretty good for you. Um, now, Neon Teichholz later talks about how more people died in the experimental group, um, but uh, he, here's a particular thing about it. Like, um, uh, one died while greatly exceeding exercise recommendations in an unsuper uh, unsupervised gym. Uh, so it it might just be somebody who, well, I, who knows, slipped on a treadmill and uh, bumped their head or they... Uh, or bench pressing and dropped it on themselves because they didn't have a spotter. There's really not enough information here to know. Um, but there's no reason to believe here that the vegan vegetarian uh, uh, diet intervention made them overexercise, right? So Nina Teicholz was a bit disingenuous, and now she pointed that out. Um, now, here is an interesting thing, like the appeal to false authority. Now, false authority... Uh, trust me, I'm a doctor. Oh, man. Uh, sorry. Moving on from there. So uh, him in particular, Dr. David Katz, he received a BA from Dartmouth, uh, MD from uh, Albert Einstein School of Medicine, um, and um, a board certified preventative medicine person, Yale Public, uh, School of Public Health, uh, MPH, which that stands for Master's in Public Health, I believe. So he, he's got a lot of credentials uh, behind them, but within his medical degree, this is something I wanted to point out. So medical school and nutrition, most medical schools, and this, you know, this is research from uh, tw uh, to 2019, sorry, uh, uh, getting a bit long-winded. I, I promise I'm going to try to finish soon. Um, uh, you could probably tell by the time on the video. Uh, so beginning with medical school, the time devoted to nutrition is limited with an average of 19 hours over four years. Uh, and is focused largely on biochemistry and vitamin and mineral deficiencies. So uh, of this, uh, like in 2017, a survey of uh, 646 cardiologists, 90% of them reported that they had not received adequate nutrition education to counsel their patients, even though 95% believed it was their personal responsibility. Well, that, uh, really, my, my point here is medical schools frequently get very limited nutrition education, or they get none. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, um, I, now, now you, you could look at, uh, like, uh, uh, various things, like, with here, but I, I do think that 
that's somewhat of a problem. So uh, whenever I say appeal to false authority, well, just because someone is a medical doctor, they frequently don't get much education in nutrition. In fact, if you took the nutrition class here at this university, you'd get more than 19 hours worth. Um, uh, so uh, there we go with that. Now here, uh, like, uh, he, he throws an apple and he says, well, like, do you need a randomized control trial to know if I throw this apple up that it's going to come back down and land? Now, this is clearly a false analogy fallacy because um, research and intuition, well, research is very, very infrequently intuitive. So uh, keep that in mind. And um, uh, uh, th that's really why we do research because our so-called common sense is frequently incorrect because we have a very narrow bandwidth of things that we can actually perceive. So uh, yeah, I do uh, it, this is just clearly a somewhat laughable uh, false analogy there. Um, he, he does the dilution effect again, and like th there's a little bit of anchoring here, which, you know, focusing on like one aspect of information a little too much, but uh, more dilution effect. You can look at that if you want to. Another fallacy that he does that is actually really effective in winning a debate is appeal to humor. So uh, he talks about a... Uh, uh, well, a shit whack and so-called shit loads, you know, like one point, whatever all of this stuff is. Um, and, and people in the audience laugh, but uh, frequently people use humor. And I, I, I try to do this myself. Now I'm not as uh, effective as he is, but uh, people use humor to frequently disarm you and sway you to their side. Because, well, we laugh at people that we like, and if you like somebody, you tend to believe them a little bit more. Um, uh, so one of their last points of disagreement, and I, uh, I'm about done with uh, this lecture, so I'm sorry that it's ran a little bit long. They talk about the Leon Hart study and what is actually going on with that study, and um, uh, they have a disagreement on there about what's really going on. And uh, uh, so it took me a while to investigate this, and I'm not going to uh, bore you too much. Um, you could pause the video or look at the PowerPoints or whatever and like read this. Here's the beginning of it. Um, but it seems like uh, the uh, what what Nina Teicholz was supporting with like kind of investigating a certain fatty acid that is a little bit more correct than what uh, David Katz is saying. So a couple of other things, um, uh, like here within this study, I had to like look at it. So I had to look in the methods and then here, uh, I, I'm not gonna try to pronounce these names. So Mediterranean alpha linolenic acid, um, rich uh, whatever, um, diets and secondary prevention of coronary heart disease. So it seems like um, uh, Nina Teicholz was actually presenting the information a little bit more accurately there. Now, I don't think this is a knock on David Katz with how many studies and things that they're actually trying to have go on in their head. It's uh, fairly difficult. And uh, well, and also, um, uh, Leon, I, I believe it was only done in France, if that's correct. Um, uh, no, no it, it doesn't matter that much. It just seemed like she was presenting that information a little bit more accurately. Um, so you could read that, uh, Green Cohort and Seven Country Study compared, well, uh, oh, okay, yes, yes, um, this seems to be what he was referencing, uh, like a different, um, study entirely, um, but, uh, li like that's neither here nor there, um, so within who won of all of this, uh, hopefully, uh, you could pay attention to a couple of these, uh, fallacies. Um, both of them had roughly equal amounts of fallacies um, uh, throughout the totality of um, the debate. Um, so I that's one thing I really liked about it is because like it really came out uh, fallaciously equal on both sides. But I don't know if uh, you want my take on it, which I'm sure most of you don't, and that's okay. Um, uh, that I. Whenever I was going through school, I was in between focusing on exercise or nutrition. And in my PhD, I did focus on nutrition quite a bit more. But I 
just just about one of the only things that we all agree on is reducing sugar intake seems to be good and exercising more seems to also be good. Uh, and here, I don't know, I just found one study that uh, exercise in young adulthood, it seems to increase the amount of fruits and vegetables that people consumed. However, it's a extremely small amount, like 0.17 to 0.13 um, increases in fruits and vegetables, respectively, which, well, what's a 0.17 of a banana? Who knows? Uh, an extra bite, maybe? But I don't know. Uh, that's the totality of the lecture, and hopefully you enjoyed it. I will uh, see you soon. Make sure to be working in your groups. All right.